Um, I want to say um, the uh, um, I've, I've been thinking a lot about some of the reviews that that the book has gotten, and um, and it's been really interesting because um, some people really loved it, um, and some people absolutely hated it, and and it seemed that on both sides the judgments were based on politics primarily, um, and but then um, there's another group of people that um, really liked the book and um, they were they claimed to be affected by it emotionally and um, they liked the literary devices that were used in the book. Um, and but they there's always there seems to always be a disclaimer in there somehow um, that I'm not taking sides on this and I'm sure there's another side to this uh, and even actually one reviewer um, uh, last Sunday in the Philadelphia Inquirer she apparently loved the book she said it was poetic she said that it was um, haunting and it affected her but she called it a polemic and mm -hmm. And she insisted that, um, actually the last line in the review said, this is a novel to be savored, dash, and to be second guessed. And, and in the review, she said that, um, you know, in the body of the review, she said that um, as she was reading, and she was so emotionally affected by the characters and the events, um, but then she had to, you know, stop herself and think that she was being emotionally manip manipulated or politically manipulated, rather. And I just, I, I can't help but think that, you know, this, that kind of comment would never, ever be said about any other historic injustice. And it is as though, um, you know, we're not allowed to have our own narrative, and that somehow, if, if our narrative con it contradicts um, the prevailing uh, narrative, which is, is uh, you know, replete with myth and, and uh, misinterpretations, um, that if, if any, anything contradicts that, then it must be inaccurate, then it must be um, somehow an, an effort to, to manipulate, then it must be propaganda. Um, and quite frankly, all she would have had to do would be to research anything she's trying to second guess. I took, it was really important to me that the, you know, that the backdrop of this book be historically accurate um, because I expected um, the kind of uh, comments that, that would come out that it's you know, made up or something. Um, and you know I didn't just research the historic events, I, I researched um, the locations, the local flora, um, local seasons and, and um, uh, you know colors and, and the local dialects, which are different, you know, in different Palestinian regions, um, you know, precisely for that, for that reason, and yet, and it would have been so simple for her to go and, and do research on anything that she suspected was propaganda, but, um, but still, that, you know, that was the review that went into the Philadelphia Inquirer, mm -hmm. so, um, I, I mean, I, I just find that really interesting, that, um, even though something can be presented um, to to the masses in the West, um, and it can be thoroughly researched and, and really difficult to impeach um, in terms of accuracy, that still people will insist that well, it can't be right. You know, um, I don't know why that is, and it's it's in some ways it's really disappointing to me. And I guess I um, I was I was a little naive in thinking that. If people could just really see, if they could see what Palestinians have had to live through for the past 60 years, they, if they could just do their own research, if then then they would see, you know. But I guess that's not really the case. Um, okay, so enough proselytizing. I will. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think maybe it's um, a little bit hard for some people to swallow and view the fact that what they know to be true is mm -hmm. different. Yeah, um, you're right, because then it would be to acknowledge that they had been manipulated all these years. Exactly. And there's also another phenomenon here at play, and, and, and Dr. Edward Said, um, are you all familiar with him? Yes. Yeah. Um, he, he once, uh, he wrote at length about this, and he said, 
that it's hard for people to imagine um, that the world's biggest victims are have become victimizers, and it's hard to it's hard to um, it's hard to hear the narrative of the victims of the victims. So you know maybe that's that's part of um, he's a, he's a lot smarter than I am, <laughs> and and I um, I accept his analysis. Um, but yeah, it, it, but it's it's disheartening, and I guess it's just you know just have to um, to keep at it, I guess. Um, so this next passage um, goes into Beirut. Um, let me see. Okay, so Amal has left the U.S. And, um, and don't worry, all the information I'm giving you really is not going to give away the story. There's, no, there's a lot more to it. So, but Amal has left the U.S. and she's going to Beirut now to um, meet up with her brother Yusuf, whom she has not seen in, in many, many years. Um, and she is in the car with um, a man named Majid, he, who came to pick her up. They just got to, um, to the uh, Sabra and Chatila refugee camps where, um, where her brother is, is living and um, where he and his wife just had a, a brand new baby. A white son followed us through the trash strewn town to Fatima and Yusuf's house. It was a single story structure with two crumbling steps leading to the front door. Its roof, like others, was mostly corrugated metal and asbestos held in place with rocks, old tires, and anything else to lend weight against the wind. Outside, a crowd of some 20 men were gathered, improvising chairs, laughing, smoking, and passing a tray of knafin, a cheese delicacy soaked in sweet syrup, no doubt in celebration of my niece's birth. There he was, Yusuf, my brother, dear God, now, after 12 years of separation, only a small distance remained, 20 footsteps at most, easily traversed, a short walk along a path where a canary cage and potted flowers tried to defy poverty. A man, he saw me and rose at once among his PLO comrades, the wax tips of his mustache curled at the corners of his smile. I dropped my small handbag and ran to him, safe in his embrace. I remained there as long as I could, trying to siphon the lost years from his massive chest, which felt so much like our father's. For a moment, my brother's arms dulled the aloneness of my life. I'm going to um, skip over this one small part so it doesn't give away the story. Fatima appeared comatose, depleted from 21 hours of labor, and my baby niece lay swaddled next to her mother in angelic sleep. They had named her Palestine, the Arabic word for Palestine. How original, I joked to Yusuf, who reached for his baby girl. Broad-shouldered Yusuf, his vast tenderness cradling tiny Palestine, was a sight to behold. When I think of him now, that sublime moment of unspoiled, unconditional devotion to his family is what I see. I still hear his words. I'm holding the most perfect of all God's creations. Like a, little, like a turn, little sis? Smalla, smalla. I took my baby niece with great care, my heart tiptoeing in that house of love. Her small mouth opened in a delicate yawn, and I moved closer to drink her scent. There is nothing quite so pure as if pieces of God live in the faint breaths of babies. In Falestine's yawn, I caught a whiff of divine promise, bequeathed even to us. I placed my niece at her sleeping mother's breast and watched my brother, turgid with affection, look back and forth from his wife to his newborn daughter. In that refugee camp, which Israel would label a breeding ground of terrorists and a festering den of terror, I bore witness to a love that dwarfed immensity itself. <laughs> 